Let's talk about One Nation Under God, the next chapter of my book. I began to question that because the more I started looking into our nation's history, you know, when, in our Judeo-Christian way of reckoning God, when we write it, we write capital G, little O-D, right? We capitalize the G. And when we're talking about pagan deities, we keep it all lowercase, right? I don't think it's by accident or coincidence that every time we see in God we trust, it's all caps. Because I think they're hiding something. And I've started to say, you know, whenever, like, political candidates and all that stuff, oh, yeah, I believe in God. Okay, great, that's awesome. Which God? Which one are we talking about here? Do you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or all these other ones he says don't have any other gods before me? Let's nail this down here. God is a little generic. And when you start looking at our nation's history, you, how many of you have been taught that this was a Christian-founded country or founding fathers were Christians and all that? Have you been taught that? I've been taught that. No. Pilgrims and Puritans? Sure. When you start looking into George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, all those guys, no. These guys are deists. These guys are Rosicrucians. These guys are Freemasons. These guys are associated with the Hellfire Club. They dug up bones in Benjamin Franklin's kitchen. They were buried under his kitchen. You know, they had the appearance of sacrifice. Now, some are trying to make excuses, say, well, he was a doctor and there was, you know, performing surgery or whatever. Sure, okay. Hellfire Club kind of rules that out for me. <laughs> <laughs> no um, sorry we have been fooled and all of the iconography proves it how many things related to our nation's founding revolve around the number 13 oh everything you know 13 colonies right you're looking at the great seal 13 steps in the great pyramid 13 letters in the, in the Latin word annu phrase annuit coeptus 13 letters in e pluribus unum 13 stars above the eagle the star of David which has nothing to do with David uh, 13 bars on the shield, 13 leaves on the olive branch, 13 arrows, 13 original colonies, 13 stars and stripes, right, on the so-called Betsy Ross flag. How many of you were told this was Betsy Ross created that flag? Yeah. We were told that, but that's not true. She was a seamstress and did make flags and probably did sew some of those flags, but she's not the originator of the design. And you can go on history.org and read it for yourself. History.org, regarding this, uh, it says, today historians almost uniformly agree that Family oral history is not particularly reliable. Though evidence shows that Betsy Ross made flags for the Pennsylvania Navy, nothing else in Canby, Canby's uh, one of uh, Betsy Ross's uh, descendants, a grandson, I think, uh, can be verified. Specifically, a few points trouble researchers. No evidence shows that a congressional flag committee existed in 1776. If one had, Washington probably would not have been on it because he was not a member of Congress. No record shows Congress addressing the flag issue in any way until it passed the 1777 resolution. Interesting, 777, uh, traditionally associated with God, the number of God, one God, right? Uh, nothing suggests that Washington ever dealt with Betsy Ross for any reason. No written material of any sort supports this story. The article continues in history.org. We do, however, have a good idea about who originated its design. Credit for that achievement may go to Francis Hopkinson, a New Jersey representative to the Continental Congress and signer of the Declaration of Independence. Hopkinson was a talented man with a strong interest in designing symbols. He played a role in creating the Great Seal of the United States, the Continental Board of Admiralty Seal, Treasury Seal, and American Currency. Documents also show that he worked on the first official United States flag. So historical documentation goes back to this guy who created all the Luciferian satanic <coughs> occult symbols on our national seal, the Great Seal. Him being the guy who created the Betsy Ross flag, which has 13 all over it. Why? Because the god that they're worshiping is Osiris. Crazy. Um, Manly P. Hall takes it a step further. He was one of the most prolific writers of Freemasonry, uh, explaining what their symbols and stuff mean. And Manly P. Hall said, whenever you see an eagle that has the point on the back of its head, it's not really an eagle. It's a stylized phoenix. Interesting. My hotel was just down the road, from, you know, Phoenix Road down here. Uh, <laughs> phoenix, uh, in, the, in the Egyptian mythology, the phoenix was the Bennu. The Bennu was the dying and resurrecting soul bird of Osiris. So Manly P. Hall is basically laughing at us, and the Freemasons are laughing at us, saying, aha, every time we put the American eagle in front of you that has a point on the back of his head, we're really talking about our god Osiris 
as defined by the dying and resurrecting soul bird that is the phoenix slash Bennu. For a much more, in my opinion, much more balanced view of America's history, I recommend, highly recommend, you check out these four documentaries by Chris Pinto. Yes? So you're saying that American Eagle is Osiris? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a bird that represents him. But it's a phoenix, not an eagle. Now, when you see an eagle that has a nice round back, like a real eagle, that's an eagle. But most of the time when you see the eagle associated with government stuff, like on our currency or other government uh, monuments and things like that, you'll see it with the point in the back of its head. And I'll show you some more uh, of that shortly. These four documentaries by Chris Pinto are outstanding. The Hidden Faith of Our Founding Fathers exposes what these guys were really into. See, who knows, who, who, what spiritual entity besides our God do you think knows the Bible the best? Oh, Satan knows it every line, doesn't he? <laughs> what criminal doesn't know the law? Well, you know, uh, so he knows it quite well. So that he has to know it so that he can twist it and manipulate it. And likewise, his servants is of unrighteousness, right? You know, we, we say, uh, Paul says, you know, no wonder because the devil masquerades as an angel of light. So it should be no wonder then that his servants would also masquerade as servants of righteousness, right? Finding themselves in pulpits, finding themselves in high positions of uh, national authority, Right by talking our Christianese lingo, they fool us by our own words. When George H. Bush was elected, or before he was selected, I should say, he uh, somebody asked him uh, if he was a Christian, and at first he stumbled over his words, and then he said, "Well, if you mean have I been born again, then yes, I am a Christian." Oh, and all the Christians went, "He spoke our Christianese. He's a Christian." until you realize that there's a sick, twisted sexual ritual that they do in the Skull and Bone Society where they go inside a casket, do all kinds of preferred things, come out, and they say, congratulations, brother, you've been born again, dot, 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 into the Skull and Bone Society. Oh, he he tricked us with our own lingo. And by the way, Junior Bush was the one who coached Daddy Bush on how to get the Christian vote. Yeah. Um, and I was a big Junior Bush supporter. W, yeah, he was my guy, loved him. Um, then I did the research on his family and the things that they've been involved in. And I'm just going to put this out there for you to research for yourself. But there is a very compelling case to be made for Barbara Bush being the daughter of Aleister Crowley. After being kicked out of Italy, Crowley fled to Tunisia, then to France, to live in Paris with an old friend, Frank Harris. At this time, while he was in Paris. He was involved in sexual magical techniques that required a variety of different consorts. Pictured here with Frank Harris is his second wife, Nellie O'Hara. While they were in Paris, Nellie and Frank came of the acquaintance of a woman by the name of Pauline Robinson. Her married name was Pauline Pierce. She associated with Nellie O'Hara and Frank Harris at the time Crowley was in Paris. Pauline Pierce returned to America in early October of 1924. Eight months later, on June the 8th, 1925, she gave birth to a girl named Barbara. Barbara Pierce married George H.W. Bush, who eventually became the 41st President of the United States. And they had a son, George W. Bush, the 43rd President of the United States. Could the wickedest man in the world, Alistair Crowley, be George W. Bush's grandfather? Look it up for yourself. And I would just say, if you can, inv- if you can imagine both of those individuals in your mind, what she looks like, just put her picture next to Crowley's picture. <laughs> They're like spitting image of each other. Um, but beyond the imagery, there are, there's a lot of compelling, let's say, circumstantial evidence surrounding where her parents were where, and who her parents were, Crowley being the father and where her mother was. Look up for yourself. That's all I'll say. But the very fact that W was also in the Skull and Bones says to me, you know what? If your favorite candidate of choice has any affiliation at all with a secret society, 
we should have nothing to do with them. You cannot serve two masters. You can't. You know, Elijah came for what reason, right? He drew a line in the sand and said, what? Choose now who you're going to serve. Because you can't serve Yahuwah and Baal at the same time. So even though a lot of these guys run on the Christian ticket and they say, oh, even Trump's out there saying, oh, yeah, I love my Bible. Uh, what's your favorite verse? Oh, I, you know, I don't want to say favorite verses. Blah, blah. God, I'm like, come on. If anybody believes that, you need to get your heads examined. Sorry, I'm just going to be point blank on it. Really? They will say whatever they got to say to fool you to get your endorsement. But your endorsement doesn't matter anyway. It, it, you, all you're doing is signing your name in agreement to the Luciferian of choice that you want to have ruling over you. What are the statistical odds that 44 presidents would all be related not only to each other, but also all to one guy, King John Lackland, the signer of the Magna Carta? If we have presidents of the people, for the people, by the people, by your popular vote, what would the statistical odds be that they would all be related not just to each other, but to one guy, King John Lackland? Yes, I get it. We're all related to Noah and I, all related to Adam the further back you go. But the fact that all of our presidents just so happen to funnel into one European royalty guy, who, by the way, was the guy who founded the Lord Mayor Parade that I showed you yesterday that honors the Nephilim giants of Gog and Magog. King John Lackland started the Lord Mayor Parade that honors the Nephilim. All our presidents are related to him. So if you want to know who's going to get selected this next time around, uh, look to see who's in the family. Yeah, and th th there's a likelihood that more than one would be, because even if John Kerry got in, he's still in the family. And he was also, uh, this is, yeah, he was Skull and Bones. When I was writing Babylon Rising, you know, it was during that whole John Kerry Bush and, you know, doing the research. I'm like, it, it wouldn't matter who Kate got in. They're both in the family. They're both in Skull and Bones. So whose agenda is going to get put forward? The people or Skull and Bones? And Tim Russert pointed that out, and shortly after Bush was selected the second time around, Oh, Russert dies of a heart attack. Really? That's rather convenient, rather convenient. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? What if Democrats and Republicans were two wings of the same bird of prey? Tonight, what if elections don't matter? What if elections were actually useful tools for social control? What if they just provided the populace with meaningless participation in a process that validates an establishment that never meaningfully changes? What if that establishment doesn't want and doesn't have the consent of the governed? What if the two-party system was actually a mechanism used to limit so-called public opinion? One young girl traced them all back to one common ancestor. They're all cousins and all grandsons of Don Lackland. It's the first family tree of its kind, pouring through more than half a million names for months. 12-year-old Bridge Ann D'Avignon discovered that all the U.S. presidents, except Martin Van Buren, are related to the former king of England, John Lackland Plantagenet, signer of the Magna Carta in 1215. She started with George Washington, but unlike other professional genealogists that only looked at the male family lines, Bridge Ann was able to link the presidents together using both male and female ancestry. Before this, historians had only been able to link 22 family trees. It, in my book, there's a lot of genealogical research, you know, going back, Dick's family, my family, these heroic and amazing tales of people who went west. But one of the things I discovered is that Dick and Barack Obama are eighth cousins. What? Is that an amazing thing? Yes, if you go back eight generations, really? they have a common ancestor. These bloodlines are literally able to be traced by genealogists all the way back to ancient Sumer and Babylonia. And these human familiars or pets of the demonic angels have worshipped Satan and his minions under many forms from the time of Sumer right up to our present day. The Bush lineage has blood ties to a great number of former presidents. George Washington, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford. 
George Bush Jr. is then found to be a cousin to both opposing candidates of his two terms in office, Al Gore and John Kerry. Democratic President Barack Obama also has blood ties with George W. Bush, as well as Gerald Ford, Lyndon Johnson, Harry Truman, James Madison, and the British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. Let me take you through this, branch by branch. The 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. <laughs> Vice President Dick Cheney, the man who's only a heartbeat away from the presidency, is actually a blood relation. He's President Bush's ninth cousin once removed. Cheney's cousin, Barack Obama, is also Bush's 11th cousin, and the ninth cousin of Brad Pitt. But we're only just getting started. President Lincoln was President Bush's seventh cousin five times removed, and Bush shared more than just a ballot with John Kerry. That's right, they're ninth cousins twice removed. There's also royalty in the Bush bloodline. Princess Diana was Bush's 11th cousin twice removed. And then there's this bombshell. He's also related to Playboy founder Hugh Hefner, even Pocahontas, and Vlad the Impaler. What if the whole purpose of the Democratic and Republican parties was not to expand voters' choices, but to limit them? What if the widely perceived differences between the two parties was just an illusion? The Matrix is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Who is it? What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world. Built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. So, again, don't believe a word I say. Do your own research. Look into this. I'm not telling you what to do, but uh, you can't fix uh, a spiritual problem with a political solution. So, yeah. All the presidents except one have been a Freemason. And I just heard the other day, and I haven't had time to investigate it, but supposedly Washington wasn't the first president. He was the eighth. The eighth? He was the, there were seven seated before him, and that he was the first Freemason. Well, yeah, well, yeah, the official establishment of the United States, 1776 and all that. But uh, if you want to go see what George was into, go to the George Washington Memorial Temple, Freemasonic Temple, and 333 feet high temple. Wow. But, but we go from the Articles of Confederation under these other presidents, all of a sudden we go to a official after the war, and it's, it's yeah. Freemason from then on. Other than Puritans and Pilgrims, that's what you run into. You know, it, yeah, they took over. And they you know, founded Washington, D.C. So let's talk about Washington, D.C. What does D.C. stand for? What? District of Columbia. This is the place ruled by Columbia. Who is Columbia? Well, all you have to do is go to the Capitol to figure that out. She's perched on top. She's on the roof. Uh... And when you, we, you know, when I first started doing this research, I had been to Washington, D.C. many times. I grew up in Massachusetts, so that's about a seven or eight hour train ride. And we would go down there for field trips and stuff like that. And, and I had a friend that was in the Air Force. His dad was stationed in D.C. when they left Massachusetts, and uh, so I'd go see him. So I'd been to D.C. many times, walked through the mall and been to the Smithsonian, go through the memorials many, many times. But how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say the red pill and the blue pill? The movie The Matrix, right? You're on the blue pill until you take the red pill. You know, the blue pill is, you know, stay asleep, nothing to see here, move along, you know, uh, it's all good, just stay in your world, content. Take the red pill and your eyes are open and you see what's really going on. 
Well, the research led me to proverbially taking the red pill, you know. Um, and I went to Washington, D.C. on the red pill and saw a whole lot of things I never saw before because I w my eyes were not open to see it. When you walk into the visitor center of the nation's capital, you're greeted by the original sculpture, statue, from which the one on the, uh, on the roof was uh, cast. Well, once you realize that Nimrod had a wife and that not only did Nimrod become known by many other names, so did she. She be uh, predominantly the queen of heaven, uh, which I just got to pause and tell a little story on that. I went to uh, uh, Malibu. Uh, well, I was down there for a conference for the, um, was it, honey, what was it called? United in Torah Conference, United in Torah Conference in San Diego. Uh, and while I was down there, anytime I get a chance to go to the West Coast, I'm trying to work on my television projects. So I'm, I'll, I'll do networking out there with producers and anybody I can get a hold of to, to try to get that project moving forward. So I spent time in L.A. and spent time up in Malibu uh, with uh, the executive producer that I'm working with right now to get the series launched. Well, um, I was invited to go to church with him to a, a really um, high-profile actor's church. I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, every, everybody here knows who he is. But I go to his church, and it was on uh, Mother's Day. And we're sitting in the church, and it's all like they have this 10-foot tall Mary statue, right? And they bring the statue out to the front, and then they had these kids come on and these platforms are carried like, you know, the poles on the shoulders, you know, kind of deal like, a, like royalty or whatever. On this platform, the kids were marched over in front of the statue of Mary, and they put a crown on Mary's head. And then they marched the, the Mary statue through the church. It was a Catholic church. Marched the, the statue, and everybody's put, I wouldn't even look at it. I'm like, oh, man, you know, this thing's back and forth, back and forth. And then they put the statue up in the front, and everybody was to go and grab a rose from this other person and lay the rose down in front of the statue, and I am like, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. There no, I was the only one in the building that didn't do it. I'm like, no way I'm going to do that. And they kept talking about Mary, oh, Mary, Queen of Heaven, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, does anybody read the Bible? <laughs> Jeremiah's got some pretty strong things to say about the Queen of Heaven. And it's not good. My heart was breaking because, I, you know, growing up in Massachusetts, um, you know, in Texas, there's a Baptist church on every corner. In Massachusetts, it's the opposite. There's a Catholic church on every corner. So literally, you know, most of my family and everybody I knew were Catholics. And I was aware of the adoration to Mary that the Catholics had, but I wasn't aware of the degree, how far it went. Now, I'm not going to say that all Catholics are doing the same thing that was going on in that church, but if they are, or to whatever degree they are, my heart was breaking because there's a huge population of people who genuinely love God, love Jesus, want to serve him, but they're in an institution that's got it all wrong. And I was like, I mean, just even in the Protestant churches that have nothing to do with the Mary stuff, you know, now that we've gotten on the Torah and started understanding God's ways and the Shabbat and the feasts and, you know, doing Bible things in Bible ways, as Jim Staley would say, my heart's breaking for the church, not just the Catholics. But that's where it was really driven home to me. I'm like, wow, God. I mean, these people are so deceived because they, they love you. You could tell these people love God. They wouldn't be in the building doing what they're doing if they didn't. But wow, we are deceived. You know, the, the, talking about a coming great deception, man, it's already here. And in our nation, you know, the Queen of Heaven, she's known by many names, Semiramis, Ishtar, Isis, Columbia, Liberty, Diana, Venus, um, and you realize Manny P. Hall talks about the creation of symbols and how symbols work. Symbols are the language of the Illuminati. They talk in symbols. <laughs> Why? Because symbols conceal from those who don't have eyes to see, and they reveal to those who do have eyes to see. Well, in order for the symbol to reveal a message, the iconography contained within the symbol has to harmonize with itself to tell the story, Right? Well, when you see phrases like e pluribus unum, what were we taught that phrase means? Out of many one, what did that mean? What, what did they teach us that, that meant? Out of many cultures. Yeah, melting pot, many cultures, 13 colonies, one nation, you know, many states, one, you know, all blah, blah, rhetoric. No, the symbol, the iconography has to harmonize with itself. So when you see various symbols like this, and we know who she represents, 
with the phrase e pluribus unum underneath her, could it then mean that it, many names, one person, one person by many names? Out of many, one. Same thing with Nimrod. When you go into, oh, well, let me back up here. Just off to the right was the movie theater where you go in and you can watch a, uh, a documentary on the, on the making of the Capitol building, as a, the construction of it. And it starts off with this all patriotic music and iconography and stuff on the screen. Wow, beautiful, rah, rah. And then the, these big letters come across the screen. The Temple of Liberty. And I turned to Sheila, I said, temple? What are temples for? Worship of gods. Which god? Well, we just passed her in the hallway. <coughs> They're calling it the Temple of Liberty, and she's perched on top and idolized inside of the building. And you go into what Tom Horn refers to the uh, rotunda as the womb of Isis, because in the Egyptian iconography, that's what it is. The, the dome and obelisk are, are the, the womb and phallus. And usually what you have is in a reflection pool in the middle, which connects the phallus with the womb for copulation. That's the, that's the symbol. That's what it me means in stone. And so when you go into the womb of Isis, the rotunda, on the bottom you see all these really nice colorful paintings that represent na our nation's history. Oh, how many of you have seen or heard of uh, David Barton's uh, wall builders stuff? You know, he paints a really nice picture of Christ the Christian heritage of our country, right? But he conveniently leaves a whole lot of detail out when he tells the story. You know, he might point to some of these pictures, and they look great. I mean, ah, rah, rah, Americana, patriotic, yada, yada. Cool. But the further up you look into the womb of Isis, the worse it gets. The, the painting on the top here is called The Freeze of American History. It starts with uh, Columbus, I think, and goes all the way around to the Wright Brothers' first flight. Um, you don't get very far in the painting where you see uh, Montezuma and Cortez and the Aztec calendar stone and the serpent wrapped around a pole deal, and you're like, the feathered serpent wrapped around the pole, and you're like, what, what does this have to do with United States of America? Yeah, okay, that's South America, you know, or whatever. Um, but, but Central or South American history, what does that have to do with the United States of America? Everything else depicted in there is talking about the United States of America. So what is that doing there? And you start seeing little bits and pieces of that serpent around the pole deal in other statues in the Capitol building as well. And then if you keep looking up past the freeze of American history, you see the apotheosis of George Washington, surrounded by 72 pentagrams. And a pentagram in the occult is a, a binding utility used to control demons. It goes back to the 72 goetic demons of Solomon. It was said that he controlled with a special ring or whatever that he could control demons and whatnot in the occult. So, and we have George Washington sitting in heaven as a god. The painting's called The Apotheosis of George Washington. Anybody know what apotheosis stands for? What it means? Anybody? It means ascending, a man ascending into godhood. The deification of man. Apotheosis. Ascending from manhood to godhood. Okay, so George is now a god. He's in heaven. And we're told this is a Christian-founded country. So if that's true and we're looking at heaven, don't you think we might see or should see characters like, oh, I don't know, Yeshua maybe? <laughs> the apostles, you know, Abraham, Moses, Gabriel, somebody? No, that's not what we see there. We see Neptune there. <laughs> we see uh, Minerva there. We see Vulcan there. Oh, this is Minerva. Actually, the other one was Ceres. Uh, yeah, Ceres, this is Minerva. Uh, Columbia, this is my favorite one. Mercury, the messenger of the gods, and our founding fathers seated at his feet taking notes in our Christian-founded country. I wonder why David Barton doesn't talk about this stuff. Wouldn't sell too many books and DVDs, probably, if he did. Uh... There he is, a close-up of George. Apotheosis, there's the, the definition. The elevation of a person to the rank of a god, deification. Um, care to guess which god he's deified as? Zeus. Zeus, exactly. When you get to Washington, D.C., uh, there's the, um, this is the train station. 
when you come out of the train station and you look up on the roof, there are all these pagan gods uh, across the whole roof. This is the far left. The far left, uh, we see this plaque, and my eyes aren't quite what they used to be, so I'll see if I can read this here. The writing between, oh, it's actually almost easier to read there. Uh, fire, greatest of discoveries, enabling man to live in various climates, use many foods, and compel the forces of nature to do his work. Electricity, carrier of light and power, devourer of uh, time and space, bearer of human speech over land and sea, greatest servant of man itself, unknown. Thou hast put all things under his feet. What does scripture say? Whose feet has everything been put under? Yeah. God says he's put all things under Yeshua's feet, right? But then yet later, Yeshua's going to present it all back to the Father, right? Thou hast put all things under his feet. Where is Yeshua up there? No, that's not who you see in the left there. That's Zeus with his lightning bolts in the left. Shortly after George Washington died, there was a government commissioned statue of him made. Probably haven't seen this. It's tucked away now, but it used to be uh, very well known. Um, yeah. This is George in the same pose you saw him in the Apotheosis painting, seated on a throne as Zeus. Very similar to what was the, often seen as the depiction of the, uh, temp the Temple of Zeus, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world. And lest you doubt that he's actually depicted as Zeus there, on either side of his throne you have these two pictures right here, one of Hercules, one of Apollo, both sons of Zeus. George Washington, seated on a throne as Zeus, the father of the gods of Greek mythology, the father of our nation according to our history. He's missing his triad. Yeah. But he's holding up with his upper hand. Well, he's doing, his, what, his pose is actually that of Baphomet, right, right. Mm -hmm. which is an occult sy a symbol for Lucifer. Huh. Okay. You know, we have some warnings in Scripture from Jesus, from Yeshua. Matthew 24, he says, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. I love what he says here. Behold, I have told you before. Now that's in King James. Other translations, basically what, what, what you got there is he's saying, Okay, guys, listen up. I've told you this before, or I'm telling you this in advance. In other words, he's saying, Okay, Closer, closer, get closer, listen up, all right? For if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. The body of Gilgamesh was found in the desert of Iraq. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. The secret chamber of Osiris was found in Egypt. This is what we should look for. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what we should be looking for. Then he has this cryptic statement here. He says, For where, wheresoever the carcass is, dead body, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, I'm going to admit what I'm about to say is pure speculation on my part. But when I was reading that, I began to wonder, what, what is he saying here? Because he had the warning of the desert, and he had the warning of the secret chambers. And he says, wherever this dead body is, this carcass, there will the eagles be. And I'm sitting there looking at the picture I had of my dad and myself in my military uniform and my dad in his uniform. And I was reminded of my time in the Army. And a lot of times when people go to uh, end times seminars and stuff like that, the question often comes up, where is America in prophecy? Or is America in prophecy? Now, I'm wondering if this scripture is not applying to us. Because when it comes, especially to the military, uh, we're, we're covered in eagles. From the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Eagles on our patches, eagles on our buttons, eagles on our you know, hats, our shoes, eagles everywhere. And our nation is known by the eagle. And after they pulled the body out of the desert sand, where did our eagle-wearing soldiers go? To Iraq. Something to think about. Going back to the eagle, um, this was the other side of the train station. On the left side was the Zeus, and on the right side were two eagles with points on the back of their head. Manly P. Hall said, eh, that's the phoenix. 
And it says between the eagles, Let all the ends thou aimst that be, thy countries, thy gods, and truths be noble, and the nobleness that lies in other men, sleeping but never dead, shall rise in majesty to meet thine own. What? Sleeping but never dead, rising? <laughs> what is that? Well, as we, we only had five hours on that trip when I went to D.C. with the red pill. And, you know, it takes weeks to go through Washington, D.C., to see everything. I mean, there's just so much to see there. So five hours is not a lot of time. We had to be very intentional about, you know, very specific. I want to see this, I want to see this, I want to see this. I can only imagine if I had a week to spend there what, what we would find because I was blown away by what we did find in the few hours that we did have. But the, the day was winding to an end, and we were like, well, we got to get back. And um, I had heard about the statue that was supposed to be in Washington, D.C. that I had, not, had yet to see. And we were trying to figure out where it was. Well, we were driving down this street, and I looked between this alley, you know, this other street between buildings, and I saw these two poles in the distance with eagles perched on them. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but let's go check it out. So we went back around, drove over to where the pillars were with the eagles looking down, and we found the statue that I was looking for. It's this statue right here called the Awakening. These two eagles on the poles were, were where you guys are. They're over here looking down on this statue of a giant bearded god coming up out of the sands of the National Harbor, and the statue, the sculpture, is called the Awakening. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. <laughs> it's like, really? Where is that statue? National Harbor, Washington, D.C. You can see the water behind us here. Yeah, that was in the National Harbor. Not too far from the train station, because we, we were there taking pictures and stuff, and, and uh, Yeshua, his name, actually the letters the, that comprise the name, means something pretty cool regarding poking out the eye. So I got some other pictures of me poking out his eye <laughs> over there. But we stayed there as long as we could, and then we had to boogie and get back to the train station take a ride back home. Um, but, yeah, there it is. And, and it wasn't long after that that we had that, uh, what hurricane was it, Sandy, I think? I think it was Hurricane Sandy that went through there and flooded that whole area. So he was buried underwater like, a, like in a flood, and all you kind of see is his hand like, sticking out of the water like a flooded giant. Very, not too different from the cover of my <laughs> Archon Invasion series.